All right, hello everyone. Welcome to today's Lunch and Learn session. Um, today talking about Grants 101. If you're joining us for the first time, these sessions are intended to give us an opportunity to talk about urban forestry best practices, um, share some information and education around trees with the public, as well as share any updates on, on current projects that we're doing. Um, we're gonna do about 15 minutes or so of dialogue between myself and our guest today, Melinda Bartlett, and then we'll go to our questions. So if you wanna use the Q&A tab to ask your questions as we go, um, at, at, at our midpoint or so, I'll go ahead and look at those questions and begin to answer some of those with Melinda. Um, but to start us off, I do wanna just take a moment and introduce uh, Melinda Bartlett, who's with LA Sanitation and the Environment, one of the bureaus within the Department of Public Works. Um, Melinda's been with the city for 35 years and is our uh, environmental affairs officer within that regulatory affairs division of LA Sanitation and the Environment. And uh, put more plainly, she oversees the team that does the tree planting grants within that division. Um, I'm super excited to have her join us as we talk about grants. As Melinda, remind us, how, how long have you been doing that grant related work within the city? So of the 35 years, I've been doing the grant work since 1992. So about 28 years. Fantastic. So I, again, I thought Melinda would be a really great addition to today's session. And I'll just note for some of the participants, I know some of the people that join may have already applied for grants themselves, be very experienced in grant writing. Um, perhaps this, this will be a little more basic than, than what you might need, but we want, do wanna just add to some of our key vocabulary around grants. I really want people to understand when we say the, tree, the city got 1.5 million for tree planting, I want us to better understand what that means, what kind of constraints are in place and, and what we can and can't use that funding for, just adding to our general collective vocabulary around grants. Um, and I, I, I foresee us doing a couple of these around grants because there's quite a bit of information to cover and we do have our a small time slot here. So we're gonna go ahead and kick it off by having uh, Melinda to share, if you can share a little bit about the impact of those LA sanitation grants, not for the last 28 years, but we're gonna look at probably the last five or six years of your tree planting grants within your division. So we've been pretty successful um, over the last six years. We've brought in eight and a half million dollars worth of funding. And these are all for um, street trees that can be planted um, in disadvantaged communities. And we are securing those funds primarily through CAL FIRE, um, which is using the California Climate Investment or Cap and Trade Funds. Um, we have this one large $2.2 million grant, which is funded by Prop 68 through the California Natural Resources Agency. Um, and that's thousands of trees and thousands of square feet of concrete that we're able to remove using those funds. Yeah, and I, I have here kind of a summary of those past five years. We can see here on the map uh, where all those trees are and one, one, almost one and a quarter acres of concrete removed. That's really tremendous. Well, that's also one of the names of your grants, Tremendous, but it's also a really tremendous number for us to look at in terms of impact. It is indeed. Uh, that's a lot of hardscape that's been opened up and we are able to put a, a new tree in that new tree well and it opens it up for stormwater uh, capture as well as providing shade and urban beautification. Yeah, so I'm gonna go back actually to our slide looking at those granting agencies. Can you share a little bit, again, you name those different funding sources, Cap and Trade and Prop 68, um, but can you explain a little bit about kind of the, the maybe the goals of the granting agencies or the, the kind of requirements that may, they may have attached to the funding for these tree planting grants. Sure, so um, the cap and trade money, California Climate Investments is funding um, to be used for um, 
Sorry, my internet connection is unstable, so I'm going to try to stick with you. Um, cap and trade is providing a pot of money to help sequester carbon, uh, di uh, carbon dioxide, uh, carbon sequestration. And that is the primary goal of the CAL FIRE um, grant. The Prop 68 grant is uh, parks and water bonds. So it is community improvements. And yes, you are uh, adding to the water quality and the water um, quantity that is allowed to infiltrate. Um, and that's Prop 68. And it was actually uh, primarily authored by Kevin DeLeon, who is now our uh, councilman in Council District 14. Yes, I, I'll, I'll, I'll add part of the reason that that's important is it sometimes will really guide the way that you approach a grant is understanding those requirements that the granting agency has. Um, I'll, I'll note that on the cap and trade California Climate Investments CAL FIRE grants, we have to use a specific tool to measure that carbon, to measure the greenhouse gas um, reductions that we might get through a project. Um, and that that is a component of then when you're developing the grant project, understanding those priorities of the granting agency and or the, the funding that's available for the project. It can um, kind of steer us and we have to navigate that a bit. Um, I, with that in mind, I, I wanna go to a discussion of disadvantaged communities specifically as one term that comes up a lot. So we have this impact, you see on the map that there's certain areas that we're planting. Um, I will note that this blue area the blue area down here, those are the port and the airport. And so Melinda, I approve that there are no trees that have been added to those areas. That's, those aren't places that we're gonna put uh, new trees specifically. But um, can you explain a little bit about this term disadvantaged communities? Absolutely. So disadvantaged communities have been identified through something called the Cal Enviro screen. And they are looking at uh, different population attributes and different environmental impacts. And they score all of these um, attributes and come up with the communities have, that are, have been most impacted by um, these factors so that they are considered environmental justice communities or disadvantaged communities that require some additional help um, to boost them up, to get a level playing field, essentially. Um, oh, Amy's answering a question, sorry. Um, so it's just, it's very important that you understand how these were developed and then they're scored uh, and they're broken down by these different colors. The deeper red, deeper oranges are the, those communities that have been most impacted. And so we try to work at communities that are 85% um, in the 85 percentile and above um, of the neediest communities within the city of Los Angeles. And, and that's what the, the map on the the map on the left here that we have shows those Cal Enviro screen. And, and again, Cal Enviro screen is a tool that anyone can log in and look at um, to see the that that burden on, on different populations. Um, and on the right, we have this map that has in yellow the entire city boundary. And then the blue areas are those that hit that 85% or greater where we are focusing um, those investments through your grants. Again, in alignment with the requirements that, that CAL FIRE and um, CNRA have for the use of those grant funds, really focused in on those, those areas. And I know, Melinda, you wanted to just flag that this isn't the only tree planting happening in the city or the only way to get trees. No, the grant funds have to be used in these disadvantaged communities, but our partners who make this all possible include city plants and city plants is able to plant across the city to anyone that is a DWP customer. So it makes it really nice that we are able to uh, get a grant for some portions of the projects that can't be funded by city plants or that can't be funded by my department. So it's, it's a nice way to put the puzzle together. 
Yeah, and that, that includes those, those really critical concrete cuts, which are the, the one funding source for those right now is through, is through your grants. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and take us on to the next kind of key term or key area that I want us to understand. And there's a lot of text on this slide, so bear with me, everyone. I don't expect you to read it all, but I just wanted to share an example. When grants are released, they have some guidelines for those who are applying for them to read through and understand again, what are the, who's eligible to apply, what kind of criteria they're looking for in a good project. Um, but then there's this area of eligible costs that's really important for, I think, all of us to understand. And that is, what will the grant pay for and what won't it paid for? And this is, again, just a snapshot from one of the grant guidelines from CAL FIRE. It doesn't even have the full list. There's a lot more eligible costs than are listed here. But this is something that I want folks to understand is um, Melinda and her team may come up with, a, with you know, their project components that they want to include in their grant application, but they are limited to what the grant will and won't pay for. And that's another thing, right now we're talking about tree planting grants. There are other grants the city applies for um, that also have some restrictions. So I know uh, when we apply for active transportation program grants, for example, they don't include a lot of options for you to fund trees or other landscaped elements, green elements, um, while they're doing additional work to help us get active transportation, like a bike lane or those things. And so sometimes we have to look at multiple funding sources to fund all parts of uh, an envisioned project. Um, but I'll just note here that one of the things that comes up frequently, especially in some of our high need communities, there's an interest in having larger trees, uh, 24 inch box or larger size trees planted. And typically we are being asked to plant this 15 gallon container size as, and, and as an urban forestry best practice, it's actually my preference to plant 15 gallon in most scenarios. I do know that some areas we need something slightly larger because of heavy pedestrian activity or other things. But Melinda, do you wanna to speak to a little bit um, about the competitive factor when we're applying for grants? Sure, you wanna stay on task when they give you options. Um, you wanna to try to use what they're trying to fund as your primary um, list of requirement, a list of, of items that you're gonna put in for your for your grant application. So if it says they want 15 gallons, if you turn around and ask only for 24 inch box, you won't be very competitive. So again, part of this goal is to stay competitive with everybody else across the state of California. We wanna make sure um, that you don't include anything that is absolutely ineligible because you'll lose points on your application and you wanna earn as many points as possible. So stay on task, stay within the jurisdiction of what they're looking for. And I know that um, another one of these ineligible costs that come up frequently is we get requests from communities to um, do tree trimming or tree removal. And unfortunately, frequently, those are not funded activities by the grant because that's seen as a city role or a city function. And they're not looking to replace a city function, but rather it, you know, help a specific project move forward and, and you know, enhance what we're already doing. And so typically that hasn't been an option. You can see that as the second item here is true removal um, to, is not an eligible cost for, for this grant specifically. And again, they're intending they have a specific metric. They're looking to offset um, carbon. They're, they're looking for that greenhouse gas reduction benefit um, and, and are focused on that with the funding that they have. We, and our job is to build a project that is gonna be again, competitive within kind of the boundaries of that funding source and then using it to really help our communities as much as possible. Um, I'm about to, oh, I do one more, one more term and then I'm gonna pivot to q and I wanted to just highlight uh, match. And so frequently, what, what, is, what is that? So essentially the granting agency is saying, what are you bringing to the table? We're, have, you know, we're making a meal together. What are you bringing to the potluck, so to speak? But they wanna see that the city is also investing in the project and they're not investing alone. And so uh, with LA Sanitation's grants, we've had really um, significant investment from LADWP city plants and match also provided by Streets LA in terms of watering some of those trees for their projects that have allowed them to be really competitive 
um, for these state grants and bring those funds in to enhance our concrete removal and, and, and uh, accelerate some of our tree planting. And, and again, uh, it's, it's a competitive element. It's good to have match, but it also is required by some grants. You know, you need to have a certain percentage. If you're asking for this much money, a certain percentage of that you should be matching and bringing to the table. And it's another really key element to building the successful grant projects that I think is important to highlight and, and show that it does take this partnership um, to get a really successful project. So Melinda, I'm gonna to turn to Q&A and I am gonna take the first question. I, I wanna ask a question myself before we get to the audience questions. And that is, um, you've got this funding for tree planting, you've got these existing, some, some finished grant projects in that first list and some ongoing. If a community member who is participating today and lives in one of those disadvantaged communities as targeted by Cal Enviro Screen, how can they get your grant program to come and plant a street that they care about? So that's a great, great question. I think um, we have a couple of ways for community members to influence uh, where this work can occur. We're looking for essential corridors and then build a footprint from those essential corridors. So if you know that you have a, a school or um, a park that needs parkway trees, and that's the area be usually between the sidewalk and the curb, and there's a strip of grass, that's a parkway. There's a lot of areas here, like in these photos, the one on the right, it's all hardscape, it's all concrete. And so the only way to get trees is to open up that concrete with a new tree well. And then this parkway, which is the one on the left, is a nice grassy strip and you might be able to get a bigger tree in there. It's all about the size of the tree. People want large, large trees, but we want to plant the right tree in the right place so that we don't um, have trees that are breaking up the sidewalk like you see with some of the ficuses that were planted long, long ago. Um, and then we want residents to say where they'd like to have trees. So again, you can contact us. Amy's going to put in the chat um, lacitysand.org slash free tree. And you can um, sign up for a free, that's our web address for a free tree. But you can see this was a school, the Lauren Miller Elementary School. And it looks on the left, it looks like a prison. And we were able to plant uh, on all four sides of that campus. Um, and it really, really makes a huge difference to the kids, um, you know, how they're walking to school and the parents have to stand out by these gates and wait for the kids to come out and walk them home. And now we're providing shade. So if you have some of these essential corridors that you'd really like to see um, planted, give us, a, give us a call or a, an email and we'll talk to you about what's available and where it fits. Um, obviously the trees do better if there's community involvement trying to get them planted and watched over and maybe watered. One of the things that we do with each of the grants is to host a huge event. Now COVID slowed us down last year, but prior to that, um, we would have these big community and resource fairs. So people could come plant trees that day. There'd be a tree adoption event. So people could go home with a five gallon tree from city plants, a fruit or a shade tree for their home. Um, and it brings everybody together. And we talk to lots of people about where they want trees to go. Again, and community outreach is great for the survivability of the trees. Agreed. And I'll just share that one of the things I love about the Arbor Day event is it's, a, a, it's the time where all of the tree planting entities get together and have a big party. It's, you know, Urban Forestry Division, this, this site and the site last year was hosted by Recreation and Parks because parks are a wonderful place to throw a big tree party. Um, we also have, you know, a, a, typically some elected officials that come out. All of our nonprofit planting partners are all together planting in the same space on one day um, and usually have great turnout by the community. And uh, it, it is bittersweet this year not to be together in April or March to host a tree planting event, but um, 
in the future, we'll get to do it again. And you're right, uh, projects are so much more successful. And actually that's a competitive element. The grant agencies wanna see that there's been community involvement in the planning of the project that it addresses a, a community identified need. Um, with that, I'm gonna look at what questions we have. So a question from Risa is, do you have any way to follow up on grant recipients to ensure that they actually plant the trees? Um, and that's, that's the first question. Um, so, uh, and actually I'll just answer that really quickly. For, for these projects, um, we, the trees are being planted for the resident. I mean, if you have the five gallon giveaways that, that were being discussed for the um, Arbor Day event, that is a separate thing. But Melinda, for your grant, those are all planted by one of the nonprofit partners, correct? That's true. All the street trees are, but the five gallon uh, tree adoptions, those are done through city plants. And with ours, um, we have people that individually sign up for a street tree and say they will commit to watering that tree. And we will send them emails periodically uh, reminding them it's a hot summer maybe and ask them to water their trees. They can contact us if perhaps there's a car accident and it's taken out their tree and they'd like a replacement and we'll try to replace it for them. So we really, we really are looking to have large scale impacts to the community. Yes, and I'll, um, so the next question there is, um, you know, is there any way to verify that the nonprofits actually plant the trees they promise to plant? And in fact, there is. So my, yes. my understanding is that the, they, they can't get paid or, you know, paid by the grant to do that work unless they invoice with a bunch of documentation showing that the trees are put in the ground. Um, it looks like uh, Risa has a very specific question around an, an association in her neighborhood that has removed trees and not replaced them, which um, I, I don't think was grant funded and definitely is not something that the city went after funds for, um, which I think we can address maybe separately. Uh, but there, there is that follow up with the nonprofit partners. They have to do a post inspection with Urban Forestry Division to ensure that the trees have been planted to city specifications in order for them to receive the, the funding and payment for that tree planting. In addition, uh, we make them, they are required to send me an after photo. So we get a before photo from Google Earth and they send me an after photo so that the granting agency doesn't necessarily have to go check all 2000 trees that we're planting, but they can look through our photo album and essentially see all of these before and after uh, photos. And, and I'll add that the granting agency does come out and do inspections. So not only are we internally looking at the work done for these projects, but the granting agency typically does an annual uh, meeting and discussion and, and a site visit to drive through uh, throughout the project and look at the sites. And then at the end of the grant period, they also do an inspection to see if they can see the trees. Um, Amy, I don't know if you've seen additional questions in the chat, because I see that some people are using the chat a little bit more, which is harder for me to toggle between, but that's okay. Um, let's see, uh, there's a question. I, I know that uh, Melinda had to turn off her camera for a while, but that's, we have a little bit of a, a bandwidth issue and I wanted her to be able to join regardless of that. So I'm glad she's able to have her video on for part of it, but that was, that was why we were in times of COVID. We have internet that is sometimes cooperative and others not. Um, I see another question, are there any community tree planting projects underway for the Olympics that could be funded with these sources? I've only heard about Metro Transit projects in time for 2028. For example, even Olympic Boulevard all the way from Beverly Hills east to downtown could use a shade canopy, maybe even down the middle of the safety, with a safety, me safety median. Um, and thanks for your program, that's from Anne. Any thoughts, Melinda, on Olympics and, and tree planting? So LA Sanitation and Environment does have um, someone who sits on uh, some of the planning committees for the Olympics. And what we were, what I was personally hoping to get was uh, the marathon route to make sure that if we can, uh, we've shaded the marathon route for sure. And we certainly are looking at routes from the airport and out and about 
Um, so yes, we're hoping to make sure, I'm sure Streets LA is also very aware of uh, the developments. The mayor's office is the lead on this, but yes, we'd love to have a, a huge canopy increase by 2028. Um, another question is, could tree planting be funded by a neighborhood council for specific locations within its boundaries? If so, who would, who would we contact to arrange and obtain details? So a little bit outside of what we're talking about today, but it is, again, funding for trees is important. Um, I think that, that I know that some neighborhood councils have paid for tree related activities. Um, Melinda, do you have any advice? So it's definitely a choice. And if they wanted to contribute some of their funds to maybe concrete cuts um, or some other portion of it, that's certainly an eligible match that we can use. Um, I think the hardest thing for the neighborhood councils and the greatest help would be to be able to water the trees. And unfortunately, neighborhood council budgets are only adopted annually and we need a commitment of three years. So that has been an issue. But if you had a council person that was willing to commit or some other way, a bid or something along those lines, um, we would love to plant everywhere we can. So we'd love your money. Yeah, the maintenance funding and those cycles is incredibly hard. And I'll just add for folks that one of the things we're aware of is that um, there definitely has been feedback in this forum and in others that people really want to make sure that we're providing sufficient establishment care for trees, that watering period that it is long enough to really um, set the trees up for success. And some of the grants, again, um, Urban Forestry Division is providing the match in terms of watering and for other grants. Um, we've got some additional funds for watering, but they're, um, not all the grants allow for as long of a time frame as we would like. And we've been exploring and continuing to discuss how to address that. We know that two years of maintenance as supplied by uh, one of the granting agencies isn't enough. And we're continuing to discuss how we make sure that those trees are really healthy. And Streets LA has been doing a great job of uh, continuing to water trees even um, after the grant period because we don't want those trees to fail. Um, but it does take, take resources. Um, I think we're just about at time, unless Amy, if you wanna flag for me a question that we haven't gotten to yet. I don't, I, I, I don't see an additional question at this point. Thank you all so much for coming and participating today and a huge thank you to, to Melinda um, for you coming on and, and sharing some of your knowledge and expertise for tree planting grants and for all the work that you've been doing for the city for so long. We're really lucky to have uh, someone with your expertise uh, leading that tree planting grants component. And I'm excited to, to see more to come, whether it's, again, I'm on those marathon routes or, or additional tree plantings around schools and parks and, and business corridors. And anyways, it's, it's really lovely. Um, again, a reminder to all of you, May 12th will be the next Lunch and Learn session. We'll get back together and have a, a chat around some tree issues and um, we'll see you then. Can I just add that for anyone who's involved with the Neighborhood Council, you should uh, make sure you advertise that anybody who wants to adopt a street tree right now in front of their home, they're eligible. Just go onto that website and sign up for it. It's in English, it's in Spanish. And we'll get someone out there to look at the site and uh, get a tree planted if you're willing to water it. That can happen really fast. So neighborhood councils, you can really influence how your area looks by just reaching out to your own community members and get everybody to sign up who wants a, who wants a tree. And if they don't have enough parkway space, look at their front lawns, because that's the next place to go. We need trees on private property to really beautify the city and help us with urban heat island and carbon sequestration. So that's it for me. I can't think of a better way to end. Trees on public and private property are really important. Thanks, Melinda. See you all soon. <laughs>